Hi, uh, I'm nervous, so we're going to just go through a bit of an introductory section before we get started with this presentation so that I can get my crap together. Um, my name is Martina Velande, and uh, here is my Twitter feed. Uh, and I work for this little company that you might have heard of called Sitecore. Uh, and at Sitecore, I'm currently a programmer writer, which means that I used to program, and now I agonize about writing three words a day. But it's cool. I enjoyed the job. Um, if you have done anything with Sitecore 9 so far, you may know me from such hits as all of the Exit Connect documentation featuring the XDB. Uh, and I'm currently in the studio doing my next album, which is um, uh, Cortex, Tales of a Processing Engine. But earlier in this year, I took a little break from all that Sitecore stuff and got involved in um, creating something called the Sitecore Privacy Guide for Developers, with particular focus on um, GDPR, the European legislation that came out earlier in the year. So in practice, it meant I spent several months in intense therapy sessions with Sitecore and GDPR, trying to figure out how um, the release of one affected implementations of the other. And that's all in the privacy guide. So today is not going to be a dramatic reading of the privacy guide, because that would be long and very boring. Um, but you can read it yourselves on uh, the doc site, or you can visit Sitecore.com and um, see kind of Sitecore's general approach to, to GDPR. Um, so I'm going to talk about what it took to get the privacy guide out there. So kind of what we went through to figure out how to get from legislation to actual practical tasks. And legal has asked me to remind you that I am not a lawyer. So everything I say is subject to the disclaimer in the privacy guide, which is also very long and on top of every single page. Um, so when you watch this presentation, you should remember that uh, I'm just a developer standing in front of some privacy legislation, asking it to be a bit clearer about what the heck compliant means. That's the vibe you're going to get today. Uh, I am very much at the beginning of my journey with uh, figuring out sort of data privacy law and how it affects tech. Um, so the presentation goals today are going to be, one, kind of giving you an overview of what GDPR is, what does processing mean, what's personal data these days, what is compliant, um, because it's very long legislation. The second goal of today is going to be to give you a practical list of things you can do to start to get there. Um, so we're going to go through a bit of a, have you done this? Have you done that kind of thing? Have you put anything in the logs? Um, of course, it's assumed that you will get sort of legal counsel or have a chief data protection officer kind of at the ready um, to, to validate all of these things. Um, and this, is, this presentation is also going to have, because I'm a person, a little sprinkling on my thoughts and feelings about data privacy. So um, kind of how I interpreted the legislation and everything that was being said about it. And we're going to also do a little bit of laughing um, because it's privacy law, so we'll try. Um, so without further ado, welcome to Sitecore and GDPR. All your data are belong to you, um, also known as the story of how I became really extra about data privacy. And here's our to-do list for the day. So we're going to start off uh, looking at how GDPR manifested itself on social media, particularly Twitter. Uh, so it's an EU law, uh, or it's a regulation. That word is important. Uh, and actually, um, it was sort of finalized on 14th of April 2016. So we had plenty of time, but obviously a lot of us left it to the last minute and got really sort of like, oh, a few months before. Everybody did that. Uh, and on Twitter, you would see things such as um, sort of prayer uh, being used as a way to comply with GDPR uh, and all encompassing the all-encompassing physical pain that it was causing people. And people were like drinking wine badly for fear that they weren't complying with GDPR. So there was a lot of fear going on. Uh, around, around this legislation. But on Twitter, you also found some actual information about what this thing was about. Uh, so the right to be forgotten was made fun of in various ways. Uh, the explicit consent thing, where people have to say actively, yes, you can have my data, that also appeared. Um, as did the right to be informed. I'm sure everybody got 10,000 privacy policy emails um, from people you didn't even know you'd signed up for. Uh, and of course, Something else that was mentioned was the fines, and they are quite severe. We'll talk about them later. Um, and it's one of the reasons why GDPR gained so much attention, I think, is because now they're really putting their money literally where their mouth is. 
Um, and all of this kind of build up towards GDPR was happening in 20, uh, well, it was happening against a background of the 2017 year of breaches. So there was a lot of highly publicized data breaches in 2017. They've kind of continued. So you had Equifax, for example, uh, 143 million uh, social security numbers and driver's licenses leaked. That's kind of horrifying. Um, so you have kind of a, I don't know about general public, but people are starting to become aware that this is a problem. So what happened later that year uh, when GDPR actually, I guess, came out or came into force? So it was kind of like a Y2K feeling. Um, well, I thought it was anyway. You didn't really have a GDPR apocalypse with everyone who was sort of not in compliance, sort of, I don't know, melted or burst into flames. Um, so what we did have was a lot of emails. Um, we've changed our privacy policy and like more worryingly, we need your consent. So you're kind of wondering, well, you kind of needed my consent before because this law isn't, you know, that, that concept isn't new. That's existed since 2003. Uh, so there was that. We also had a lot of websites just saying, we're not going to serve you content anymore, um, particularly in the US because it's unclear what GDPR means in the US in some respects. So some sites just not going to show you content if you're coming from Europe. Uh, we also had companies just deciding to give up the ghost. Uh, so Clout was one of them. Uh, and they said that, uh, I mean, Clout is one of those companies that used artificial, art, uh, artificial intelligence um, to kind of make inferences about you and your behavior. So companies like that just decided not to do this anymore. Uh, and the next thing that happened was uh, a lot of lawsuits. So the big boys and girls were targeted with lawsuits pretty much on the day by activists, Facebook and Google, because they handle a lot of personal data. Uh, and we had a bunch of smaller lawsuits as well. So um, the one at the top uh, is kind of, kind of an interesting one, because it's not so obvious that GDPR would be an issue for the who is, um, people who, who hold who is information. But they're storing um, often information in triplicate, so the same name three times, which is kind of against the data minimization aspect of GDPR. So you get like a small trickle of um, legal cases coming through now. Um, at a consumer level, I've started to notice that things like this, tick this if you do not, 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 not want to be contacted, that used to exist on sites uh, called dark UX by some people or also just being terrible. Those are starting to disappear, um, but they are being replaced by something that looks like this. So you get onto a site, they are gonna track you, and you can either agree or press the ominous go to settings link, which is usually going to be super tiny. Um, and it's going to take you on this wonderful journey to long lists of advertisers and cookies that you can switch on and off. Um, I found that uh, when I tried to opt out of some of them, they just said that, oh, it's temporarily unavailable to opt out. Some of them said opt out through the company. So if you're not tech savvy and you're, you want to sort of protect your privacy. You've gone to this site, you have a, like a long list of things you have to opt out, opt out of. Uh, and some of them say, oh, you actually have to go to Google to do it, or you have to go to so-and-so to do it. And you think, how is the kind of normal person going to know how to do all those things? And are you going to do it for every site? So really, in many cases, opting out was actually more difficult than getting to Mordor. It was just, you know, it was not cool. Um, and as a consumer, it made me kind of think, mm, I'm not really liking how people are interpreting GDPR so far. It's supposed to be about transparency and respect for people's personal data, not leading them down this wild goose chase to try and like claw back their name from you. Um, and it's not the only thing. Like GDPR isn't sort of this, this sort of one-off. Um, you have more privacy legislation coming out of the EU. And you have one in the US, the California Consumer Privacy Act, which is going to come into force in 2020. Um, so Data privacy and concerns about it is really gathering speed. Um, people like, like this guy, who you know had a little bit to do with the internet, uh, is starting to talk about how to sort of decentralize personal data and, and, and protect people. So it's definitely something that's on people's minds at the moment. So privacy is, you know, it's not this sort of fringe thing that nobody cares about anymore. Um, but what is it really? So what does it actually say? So we're going to have a little look at uh, what's in the giant textbook. Uh, and here I want to give a special shout out to the PSYCOR GDPR 
work group or emotional support group that got me through the three months. Thank you. Um, so the first thing to note is that GDPR is not, it's not a new thing. Uh, in the EU in particular, you have had directives way before then, way back to 1995, trying to deal with these sorts of privacy issues. Um, so you had the Data Protection Directive, the E-Privacy Directive. Uh, you know, it's, it's old stuff. It's existed for a while. The key difference is that these guys were directives uh, and regulations. So directives you can kind of interpret on your own. Like regulation is the big daddy. You have to do what it says uh, in every country. So that's one of the big differences. Um, and then, of course, there's differences in the actual content. So let's go through them. Uh, some few choice ones, anyway. So the definition of personal data has changed. Um, it used to be like names, photos, and email addresses, but now it's been expanded. So now IP addresses, um, mobile device identifiers, biometric data, and um, things that kind of relate to your physical, psychological, genetic, mental, economic, cultural, and social identity. That's broad, right? That could be anything. Uh, that's now defined as personal data. There's this emphasis on data minimization. So rather than collecting everything you possibly can, there's an emphasis on collecting only what you need and only using it for the purpose that you stated at the beginning. So you know, being honest with people. And there's a bunch of data subject rights. So there is um, this idea of having active opt-in and consent. And let's just, let's just look at some legislation. I've highlighted it so you don't have to read the whole thing. Um, consent can't be, a service can't be or sort of a, you, you don't have, mm, let me start again because this is complicated. If you want someone to opt into your marketing stuff, you can't hold your service hostage. Uh, and say, if you don't sort of agree to get terrible emails from me, you can't use this insurance website, for example. So consent can't be conditional, uh, which I think is, is great. You can't uh, force people to give you personal data anymore. Uh, the other um, data subject right that's been talked about is the right to be forgotten. So you need to be able to um, delete someone from your system. And most companies aren't just going to have data in one database or one system. It's going to be many, and they're probably going to be linked. So this is going to be quite a challenge. There's also the right to access. So being able to get a dump of all your data. Uh, what are you holding about me? Um, uh, just get, getting that sent to you in a machine readable format. Uh, and then there is things like liability. So it's not just the controller holding the data that's responsible anymore or liable anymore if something goes wrong. It's also the people they feed that data to. Uh, and there's more consistency in how you report a breach um, and who you report it to. Um, and there's an emphasis on data protection by design and by default, so making sure you're secure by default. But the, by far the biggest thing that they did with GDPR, uh, you know, the real sort of uh, power, uh, is the fines. Uh, and these are the fines. This is what you have to pay if you are in breach. Uh, and I don't think they've, um, I don't think that they have successfully kind of extracted this money from anyone yet. Um, so it's 10 million or 2% of your global revenue uh, if you're a small company, or 20 million and 4% of global revenue if you're a larger company. Not really sure on the ex what it means large company. Um, but they will take whichever one is biggest. So imagine being like a seriously large company and them saying, give me 4% of your global revenue. That's pretty terrifying. Um, so that's one of the reasons why GDPR has gained so much attention, because they will slap your wrist with a sledgehammer now. But let's talk a little bit about what this um, compliance thing means. So this is something that we kind of talked about a little bit internally, uh, trying to figure out how to be compliant, but what does it mean to be compliant with GDPR? And one of the challenging things was, what exactly is information relating to an identified or identifiable natural person? What does that mean? Uh, and the tricky part is, in the definition, they talk about directly or indirectly identifying someone. Uh, and they talk about kind of more vague things like your mental or cultural identity or your social identity, like your, um, I don't know, what religion you belong to, for example. And the reason we have to think a lot about this is because we and many other companies talk about having this 360 degree view of the customer. Um, you know, omnichannel, bringing all of your data in together, linking it so it's easy to identify you. And that means we have the potential to store a lot of data about a single person. And more importantly, it's centralized. 
So it's all linked together. You have this like huge image of who someone is, especially if you collect a lot of data about them. Um, and there was a lawsuit, or sorry, not a lawsuit. There was a breach um, recently, the Facebook one, where uh, a bunch of tokens that you use that are, get generated when you sign into uh, using your Facebook ID were leaked. And you can imagine those tokens are used to authenticate on various different sites. So suddenly you have the central Facebook identity linking you to every site that you have used to sign in with, and that data has been leaked. So that's pretty scary. And in Sitecore, we have this concept of a contact identifier. So that can link, it can link your um, kind of XDB data to your Twitter account maybe, or some Facebook, or maybe a CRM record. Maybe you brought data in from a username somewhere. So we have this potential to, to link people, link data within the XDB to a lot of external systems. Um, and not only that, but we have the potential to store a lot of information about your behavior. So all your browsing, if you use FXM on a site, all your browsing on some third party, not third party, but some sort of smaller site that might not even run Sitecore. And you start to wonder, how much behavioral data do you need to collect before you unmask someone, even without personal identifiers like their IP address? And if you really start to look into interactions, what is actually in your search event, for example? So if you take Google, you might Google your own name. Um, and because we tend to use natural language when we talk to a search engine or in search, you might have revealed something really personal that that's now going to be you know, in your interaction data. And I know, because I live on the internet, that it is an all about me book. I'm terrified of that, but I, I know that it is. You have all these data points about me. Um, and once you start to add things like artificial intelligence to it, I'm kind of thinking, mm, it's just going to you have all this data about who I am as a person. Now you're adding a robot. Uh, and I might get some predictions back that I don't really like or I don't really care for. So we're in this age now where we have this Sauron-like overview uh, of people. We collect so much data about them. Um, and that's why GDPR is so critical, because we're trying to hold companies accountable for that. Um, and when I was reading GDPR, it really occurred to me that it's all about, not all about, but it is very much about the spirit of the law. So responsibly handling people's per personal data and thinking about the ethics of collecting data from vulnerable people or kids. Um, and really, this is everyone's business, not just the chief uh, data protection officer. Um, it's developers' business as well to make sure that we are handling personal data responsibly. Because um, we don't really know what is personal data. I mean, I think interactions are personal data. I think browsing history, you know, you're not going to give me six months of your, or six years of your sort of Google history. It's very personal, especially if it's all released at once. So um, what about Sitecore? So we've talked about how GDPR kind of manifested itself and the issue with compliance. Um, how can Sitecore help you on your road to compliance? Again, not a lawyer. You uh, need a data protection officer to um, kind of figure out what compliance means for your business. But let's assume that we're in a company. The uh, European Data Protection Board is knocking on your door, ready to like inspect everything. You have a stereotypical hacker in a hoodie in your basement trying to look at your data. Uh, it's PI planning week, so your boss is putting loads of uh, sticky notes on the board, and one of them happens to be GDPR. Um, and we really want to be these people. We want to be the people who can send an email that says a small amount of encrypted data that we had your consent to store was leaked. Sorry about it. Um, we don't want to be these guys. And the first step, really, is um, you know, big data used to be a big thing. Now we're really into data minimization, so collect only what you need. And the XDB is not really supposed to be a big bin of whatever. We're supposed to only really put data into it that's going to enrich the experience, and now um, stuff that you have consent to put in there. So let's talk about the data subject. Um, and let's also talk about uh, how we store links or how we link um, records in Sitecore. And Sitecore is a big beast now. This is our latest kind of um, architecture diagram, I guess. We have a lot of server roles, a lot of processing happening. And a data subject is represented in um, four different ways across the platform. So you can have a user record, a contact record, a customer, and uh, some forms data. 
So let's go through each one of these and talk about what you need to, what you need to consider when you're making sure that you're only collecting exactly what you need and not too much. So um, the user is stored in well, the core database if you're using .NET membership. Um, or if you're using identity, then it's like you know, Azure Active Directory or something like that. But that's where the user record is. Uh, and you need to think about who can access that data through the user manager, so tighten up your security. And um, do you have a, an audit trail? Are you logging personal data? Because if someone logs in, uh, you put their <laughs> credentials in logs, you've got to make sure those are secure. Um, and of course, if you've added any additional data on top of like name and email and username, just, just make sure that you, it's sort of slim as possible. The contact um, record is stored in the XDB. It's also indexed uh, in the XDB search index, and it gets loaded into private and shared session state. Um, and this one, you kind of need to work a little bit harder to make sure it doesn't sort of get loose and sort of personal data ends up where it shouldn't be. Um, so here are the things to think about with the contact. Uh, make sure you don't put any personal data in interactions at the moment. Uh, we don't, there's no, um, currently, <laughs> there's no way to clear personal data out of interactions. Make sure you mark anything that's personal or that you might consider personal uh, as PI sensitive because that means it will get cleared when you execute the right to be forgotten. Make sure you uh, check which facets you're loading into session. Only load the ones that you actually need in session and don't uh, put stuff in there if it doesn't need to be there. Don't put contact IDs in external system. Uh, even when you clear someone's data, their contact ID is still there. So if you've uh, created links between that contact ID you know, and other records, you're, you're sort of centralizing the data. So that shouldn't be in any external system. Think about what you are accessing during aggregation. Um, aggregation for reporting should be anonymous, so you shouldn't be writing personal data to the reporting database. Be careful about populating the locale info facet because it's an interaction facet and uh, you know, it contains uh, location information. Consider whether you need to hash or redact IPs. Um, make sure that you aren't storing or just be wary of what you're storing in your search event and your page view event. So if you have a query string in your page view event that kind of goes email equals this and like it's saved in the XDB, that's personal data kind of leaking into interactions where it shouldn't be. Think about what you put in your marketing automation activities. So if you're going to store some temporary data in an activity, you know, do you really need to? Because that's putting personal data again in another database. Um, and kind of think about how your tracker submit queue is implemented. So are you writing to a little database in case XConnect goes down? How secure is that? Finally, if you are using um, commerce, then your data subject is going to be represented as a customer as well. So they're going to be in the shared environments database. Um, you might have email and shipping addresses in the actual order. They'll be in the customer scope index, uh, and there will be parts of their behavior in the XDB as well. As of 902, we don't put any personal data in interaction facets. Oh, sorry. Yeah, in interaction facets anymore. So it's recommended you get to 902. And we link all of these records. Or you can, sorry, you can link all of these records. So you can link um, users to contact via an identifier. Customers are linked to users via external IDs. So there are, you have this really rich picture of who someone is, like how do they behave on your site? What do they buy? Um, any behavior that they do sort of as a logged in user. So we need to go through that and kind of have a Dexter kill room approach where you get out your little Q-tips and just sort of scrape around and make sure that there's no personal data hiding anywhere where it shouldn't be. Uh, and some kind of pro tip I'll give you is check your logs. You know, if you're writing an exception, are you just dumping out like people's contact identifiers, which might have their usernames or their email addresses or their IDs? Are you putting something in a cache that you maybe forgot about? So these little things can, um, yeah, they're, they're the big ones because you might not think that oh, a log getting loose into the world might not be a big deal, but if you have personal data in it, even if it reveals that someone uses a site, that's still not cool, depending on what the site is. So apart from making sure you're only collecting what you need to collect, so data minimization for the win, um, you need to make sure you're complying with certain data rights as well. Um, the one that most people have heard about is the right to be forgotten. So make sure people can be erased. 
Uh, and Cycro has this uh, nifty method in the XConnect client API that will clear everything marked PII sensitive on the contact. So make sure you have marked everything PII sensitive that you can or that you need to, sorry. Don't store anything in interaction facets again. Uh, and when it comes to an EXM plugs into this, you don't need to worry about it. Um, and for the customer record, make sure that you've set the customer, set the customer remove policy uh, up in such a way that contacts are actually cleared, they're deleted, or sorry, customer data is deleted. It isn't just marked as inactive, because that's not really good enough. And with the user, you just need to, uh, you know, use a security API to either clear it or, you know, delete identifying information. Um, so we help you there. The most important one there is, is the right to be forgotten in the client API. Um, yeah, and here is sort of where some extra data is that you need to consider. So email addresses and shipping addresses and orders. Just know that it's there. Um, I doubt you'd have to delete that, but just know it's there. Uh, and same with interactions, just to remind you, uh, locale info and IP info, they're interaction facets, uh, so you can't clear them at the moment. Um, so don't populate them or redact them uh, or just make sure they're secure. Um, the right to access, so make sure people can access their data. There are APIs for each one of these uh, contact records, or sorry, um, data subject entity records, contact, customer, user. Uh, you can set up a self-service portal or you know, something that your admins can use to clear this data. Uh, but be wary of hacked accounts. So imagine you've set up the self-service portal where you press a button and get all your data. Imagine if a hacker does that, presses the button on this person's account and gets all their data, you've just made the situation like 100 times worse. Um, so consider implementing two-factor authentication or something like that um, if you're going to give people access through a button on the site. Uh, on a related note, restricting processing, so the right to restriction of processing. If someone's kind of contesting that you have the right to process their data or they're saying actually the data is incorrect, you may need to be able to export that data, put it in a system um, that doesn't do any processing whilst you figure that out. Um, and you can use the same API, so the XNA client API, um, or you can just um, delete them if, if they kind of agree to be forgotten. Um, yeah. And there's a big one, um, consent. So make sure we have consent. By default in Cycle, we have this thing called the consent information facet. Um, but you might want to might create a more nuanced facet that kind of takes into account your specific situation. <clears throat> so these are the things we have by default. So you can have consent revoked, but like for what? For everything, there's a lot of processing in Sitecore. Uh, and do not mark it, which EXM uses, and whether you've asked to be forgotten or not. But you might want to create your own thing where you say, actually, don't track me, but you can do other stuff. Or I don't want to be um, involved in any machine learning processing, for instance. But that's entirely up to you. Sitecore gives you the flexibility to do whatever. And then there is the whole make sure people can opt out, which is a little bit more of a head scratcher. And this is where we get to Sitecore and GDPR++. So in Sitecore, there is a lot of ways to, um, or a lot, a lot of processing going on. If you define processing as just like touching someone's personal data in any way. We have email marketing. Um, you've been able to opt out of that you know, for a long time. We have a double opt-in process there. Um, but things like personalization and content testing and tracking, which happen kind of automatically when you land on the site. Uh, marketing automation, you know, how do you prevent somebody from being added to, to, um, to a plan. Uh, collection, I mean, you kind of, if someone hasn't consented to be collected, you shouldn't collect. Um, but processing and aggregation is another tricky one. Um, you have to find out from your legal counsel if just the act of loading someone's data in to use anonymous stuff about them to um, create reporting, would that count as processing? And it really depends on your situation. Uh, consult, you know, legal counsel. And where tracking is concerned, at the moment, that's going to be a pipelines thing. So the recommendation at the moment is that if someone comes onto your site and says, I do not want to be tracked, you can persist that in a cookie anonymously. Uh, so not with an ID or anything like that. Uh, and then next time they come onto the site, you read that cookie and you um, might treat them as a robot, for example, and then they're not going to be tracked anymore. But it is something you're going to have to do with pipelines at the moment. So looking forward to the processing engine, um, 
let's talk a little bit about what that is first, because it's brand spanking new. So the processing engine is this service that runs in the background. It has a bunch of agents uh, that have a bunch of workers that do a bunch of stuff. I mean, that's kind of old of computers, isn't it? Some stuff that does some stuff. Um, <laughs> but these workers, they project your data into a tabular form if you want it. Uh, they do data processing tasks. Uh, and they can run your training or, evalu or, or um, evaluation implementation. So we don't do any kind of built-in uh, machine learning. You kind of choose whether you want to run your own machine learning code or outsource it to kind of a system that does it for you. Um, so really what Cortex does is the heavy lifting, gets data out of the XDB, it kind of um, makes it into a tabular format for machine learning, it can send um, send data off to whatever you want, like do you want to use a Watson or machine learning server, it's up to you. Uh, and then you can customize it to write the results back to a contact. So it does the sort of boring stuff so you can get on with the cool kind of data science stuff. Um, so you know, I might do this. Here's some data, here's where my model is, and here's a script. Go send that off to um, some third party, get some results back. And why is this, what does this have to do with GDPR? Well, as far as I can tell from my research, it's all about this right to explanation. So the idea is that you don't want to end up in this kind of Franz Kafka nightmare where the machines are making the decisions for you and you're like dying in a bureaucracy which you can't get out of because there are no humans and nobody has a soul. It's a little bit dramatic, um, but GDPR specifically mentions automa automated individual decision making, including profiling, so making decisions about someone via a machine. Um, and it has this in a recital, and a recital, here comes my EU uh, legislation knowledge, uh, a recital is different from the actual law. It's sort of a footnote, almost extra information, so it doesn't have any binding power on its own, but it can use to clarify. Um, but it talks about needing to implement suitable safeguards uh, so that if somebody wanted to kind of say, mm, I kind of want a human to make a decision about this thing that you've used my personal data to kind of magically spit out a decision about, um, then they, they should be able to. So essentially you have to tell them, hey, we're going to do some AI stuff uh, with your data. Is that okay? And if it turns out that you need consent for that, again, talk to your lawyer. Uh, we have this thing called a data source, which you can customize. Uh, so you might only get the contacts that haven't uh, agreed or that have agreed to um, whatever machine learning it is you're running. So um, beyond that, uh, kind of on the roadmap, uh, we are thinking seriously about data grooming. Uh, so the ability to you know, get rid of interactions. Uh, we are thinking about uh, if you have put personal data into, in interactions, or you have to for some reason, uh, being able to delete those as well. And internally, we do use GDPR checklists for every single component um, we build. So we talk, look at any personal data, it's processing or storing, and figuring out how we can help you comply. And you can read about all that uh, in the privacy guide. But really, the main, the main takeaway I want you to have um, from this is that it's kind of just about being cool. So going with your gut on what feels right. Uh, and something that came up a lot in the articles I was reading about data privacy was, especially for the, the big ones, was that they were kind of complying, but in some questionable spirit, you know? So they were going by the letter of the law, kind of maybe can't be sued, but you maybe look at what they've done and you, you don't really feel good about them as, as, as a company. And I would recommend that you have a look at the Soul in the Machine um, blog series by my colleague. Because he talks a lot about ethics and programming and um, kind of how GDPR and this, new f this focus on machine learning kind of makes you think about how you should be treating people who are your customers. Um, and I think that data privacy is going to become a little bit like HTTPS. So I don't know about you, but I recently changed electricity providers because they had HTTP. I'm like, is this 2001? Um, and I think that the data privacy will become one of those things that sets a company apart. So you're, you're going to start to judge companies by how well they treat your data. I've read a lot of privacy policies recently. I don't know if anybody else does that. Um, but I really judge the companies that said things like, 
you know, we send your data off to some other processors um, that, you know, might not be in your area and therefore legislation doesn't cover you. And I'm thinking, well, why? You haven't told me why. Um, so it's going to become a differentiator, definitely, how well you handle people's data. Uh, and hopefully, um, if you're using Sidecore, you have gotten some tips today on, on how you can start to, um, in your Sidecore implementations, give people's personal data a bit of love, usually by not storing it or not collecting it. Um, and that is everything for today. Thank you very much.